Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 2nd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Dukes show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what the legislature's fiscal policy working group is missing in its public analysis so far. Second, we explain why Representative Wool's HB 37 isn't much of a compromise once you fill in the missing part. And third, we explain the most recent new turn the oil search saga has taken and how that impacts Alaska's fiscal condition. And now, let's join Michael. We'll start off with a weekly top three. Uh, the information that the working group is missing, in your opinion, and that, of course, we've been talking about that. That is the proportional uh, 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 analysis of where this goes and how this impacts various people. Let's talk about that, number one, on the weekly top three. Michael, I've been frustrated uh, by uh, the working group um, in one significant respect. They've They've concentrated most of their efforts thus far on I, on agreeing to a baseline uh, uh, fiscal uh, condition of the state over the next 10 years um, and looking at what the uh, budget deficit is. But to this point, uh, they've not really looked at uh, the solutions other than PFD cuts or some vague discussion of sales taxes. They've not looked at, or Adam Wool's HB 37, which we'll talk about in the next segment, but they've not looked at what I think is the most important part of, of uh, the fiscal process, which is who pays, which is what the impacts are by income bracket, what the, what the impacts are uh, on the economy uh, as a whole. The revenue process is, is, is really simple. It's two parts. One part is identifying the deficit or the hole you're in that you need to that you that you need to address, but a co-equal part is is the impacts of how you address that, the relative impacts, looking at the who pays question and then the economic uh, impact uh, of of various uh, options, and and the legislature has plenty of to be able to do that. The 2016 ICER study did that. The 27 ITEP study uh, did that uh, in, in greater detail with respect to the distributional impacts, the, the who pays uh, impacts. Um, so there's plenty of material out there to do it with, but they haven't done it. And the thing that's frustrating about it is to me, uh, this is the greatest, the who pays argument is the, or the who pays analysis is the greatest argument there is against PFD cuts, against using PFD cuts uh, to close the gap. Uh, when you use PFD cuts, uh, we've got a chart uh, that, I, that I've done before, we've talked about on the show before. When you, when you look at PFD cuts, they have, they're, they're hugely regressive, have a much bigger impact on middle and lower income Alaska families than they do on the, on the top 20%. The unfairness in equity of using PFD cuts just sort of leaps off the page at you when you when you do a distributional analysis, and and I think I think those who support uh, a statutory PFD or support a, a POMV 5050 are losing the opportunity to make their best case 
by not having uh, a distributional analysis uh, in front of the committee. Now, I understand that ICER is going to do a presentation today. Ralph Townsend is going to do a presentation uh, today. Uh, that centers on the ICER uh, 2016 study is going to talk uh, talk through some of the points about that that study made about the distributional analysis um, and about the uh, uh, the economic impacts. And maybe that's a start of uh, of a of a process that the that the working group's going to go for go through. But you can't stop with just the ICER analysis. You can't say, okay, now we understand, you know, sort of what ICER said in 2016. What you've got to do, uh, what the revenue process, the traditional revenue process does, is lay out all the options, like like the ITEP study did in 2017. Lay out all the options then go through the, the distributional analysis and then go through the economic impact uh, of each of the options and make selections from that. You just you just can't say, oh, we got a deficit of $1.5 billion, which we do. Right. You just can't say, oh, we got a deficit of $1.5 billion, <clears throat> billion dollars, and just say, oh, well, we're going to use PFD cuts because that's a big number and, and that fills it. You just can't do that without understanding uh, the distributional analysis and the economic impact uh, of, of that. So I... It hopefully today's presentation by ICER uh, will start down the road of zeroing in on on an economic impact. But it troubles me uh, that frankly they're having ICER do it as opposed to Ledge Finance, uh, who has the same tools, could could be able to do it themselves, and have Ledge Finance zero in on the exact uh, 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 fiscal approaches, the exact revenue approaches that the working group has under consideration. Are, are you trying to say that that they that they just wouldn't? They wouldn't want to be faced with the problem. I mean, Brad, is that what, you know, and Larry says in the chat room, well, you know what they say about charts they don't build. They haven't been stress tested and thereby they aren't valid. I mean, this is a reference to Mike Shower having those charts put together in the uh, the Anchorage Daily News, you know, drinking their their tea with their pinkies pointed in the air saying, oh, well, you know, these uh, these these these, you know, flawed charts and everything charts that were put together by ledge finance and stress tested and put together. So it's basically uh, la, 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 people putting their fingers in the air. They don't want to hear it. Yeah. And we're, we're going to talk a lot about that in the second segment with Adam Wools. I mean, there, there's a there's a trick going on here with Adam Wools that I just think is is outrageous. Um, and, and we'll talk about people sticking their fingers in their ears. Right. But 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 you've got to you've 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 got to understand what you're doing. I mean, one of the one of the big problems that we've had uh, over the last decade is we haven't understood what we're doing. I mean, we haven't understood who we're pushing the the, the, the burdens to. We haven't understood the economic impact. I guess I should say some people have understood that, but but the the, the legislative process hasn't brought that up in hearings, hasn't brought it up publicly in a way that the that the that the media uh, report on it. And so it's just sort of like, oh yeah, there's a b bunch of money in the PFD. We ought to just take that uh, and and plug the hole without right. understanding who that's hitting and what it's doing to the overall Alaska economy. Now you had a chart that you attached to this, and I have it up on the screen for folks who are watching on Facebook, or if you want to go out and look at it, uh, Facebook.com/slash Michael Duke Show slash Live. You can see the uh, chart and the revenue process. Run that. Run us through that real quick. So the revenue. So the first half of the revenue process is identify identify the deficit. Done. Got that. Second part then is identify the potential alternative revenue measures. And ITEP in 2017. This is based on the ITEP report. ITEP in 2017 about looked at five of them: a progressive income tax, sales tax, PFD cut, payroll tax, and payroll plus uh, investment tax. And then. The, the process is, okay, you got the alternatives. Now what do you do with those alternatives? Then the process, and this is this is federal government, 49 other states, this is traditional rev, this is traditional revenue analysis. Uh, then the process is evaluate those options based upon the impact on families, the, the distributional impact uh, on families, who's paying and, and how much are they paying relative to others. Uh, and then evaluate the the impact on the on the economy. What's the impact of, for example, having a regressive, hugely regressive, 
approach like PFD cuts? Well, ICER told us in 2016 it has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy of all of the options. So you you do that evaluate, you take the, you, you you get the proposals, you do the evaluation, you score the you score them, and then you make a judgment based upon um, the impact on families, what, do you, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to shove the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families, you know, minimize the cost, trivialize the cost of the top 20%, the FD cuts are pretty good. And, and, and that will tell you that. But if you're trying to be fair to Alaska families, have all Alaska families have the same skin in the game, PFD cuts are a horrible way to do it. Um, and then you and then you look at the score, the impact on the overall Alaska economy. Are you trying to improve the economy or, or relative to other steps? Are you trying to harm the economy? It will tell you that. And then you and then you can make a judgment of the tool you use to close the deficit uh, based on based on that scoring. And and Senate finance has never done that scoring. House finance has never done that scoring uh, since we started down the road of PFD cuts because, because it would show exactly what it shows. It would show that you've pushed the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families and you've used the tool that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. If this working group is, gonna, is going to come up with something that is fair to Alaskans, and is fair to the Alaska economy, they have to go through this analysis. They have to do what 49 other states do and what the federal government does. Um, and as I say, maybe uh, the ICER presentation today will be the start of that. But this, the ICER presentation isn't, isn't it. The ICER presentation, for example, doesn't evaluate all of the tools that ITEP evaluated in, uh, in 2017. It doesn't evaluate, evaluate a flat tax, which I think after you go through the evaluation, is the is the right is the right approach to take. Um, so ICER, the ICER presentation today may be a start, but it's only a start. You have to you have to continue and dig down uh, into the uh, into the the bowels, the impacts of uh, of each of the uh, of each of the approaches you're taking. I think this comes down to this, Brad. Um, I, I think that they just they are obviously don't want to see the truth. They don't want to look at these these uh, uh, distributional models because they understand that they have to face the facts. I mean, that's really, it's all about avoidance at this point. It is, Michael. And and as I say, we're going to get into that with Adam, Adam Wool's HB 37 in detail, but it is avoidance. And so here's the deal. I mean, we've got one of the great things about this working group is each caucus has two members, equal members, right? Uh, and presumably they have part of the deal, as as was explained at the time that they set up the working group, each caucus has input to what the working group uh, considers. Um, so, you know, my, my, my message is <laughs> to those in the in, in the House Minority Caucus and the and uh, Senator Hughes in the, in the Senate Majority Caucus, get this on the agenda. This is to Alaskans, to me. This is the best argument we've got for why the PFD uh, should not be uh, the fiscal tool that we're using to raise revenues. Uh, it takes hugely amount more from a, a single mother uh, with $40,000 a year in income than it does from Senator Von Emhoff. I mean, multiple times uh, uh, in terms of the income share that's being taken by PFD cuts. Get that out in front of Alaskans, and I think it has an impact. Uh, on Alaskans, but but it takes you know some push. Uh, it would, I mean, House Finance has never done it. Senate Finance has never done it. This is the opportunity to get the information in front of Alaskans. Take it and use it, and push uh, the 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 working group to uh, to be public about the distributional impacts and about the economic impacts. Which again is disheartening because supposedly, as you said, we've got all these equal groups in there that somebody should be making a squawk about this. Somebody should be saying, well, look, we need to have this discussion. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I think it's great that Mike Shower's in there and he's got all these options in there, but it does nothing if they don't look at the, you know, the, first of all, they don't look at the distributional impact. Second of all, they don't look at the the outlying long-term effects of it. I mean, again, with Shower's different plans, he lays out how long each one of those is going to take to uh, clear the deficit and to get us back into the black. 
And yet that seemed to really not get much headway or get much fanfare in those committees. It was like, okay, well, th thanks for putting that out there. Let's move on over here to this other stuff. Yeah. I mean, to some degree, it's, I mean, especially Senate finance with Natasha and with Bert, it's pre-cooked. They want the PFD. Right. So one of the bad things about the Alaska legislative system is the majority decides who appears and what they talk about, right? right? They control the agenda. At least in Congress, the minority gets some say in what witnesses are called and what presentations are made. In Alaska, it's just all you know, yeah. all majority. So once they set on and once they once they decide what they want to do, all of the gotta, information they get is go. pre cooked. What should we be doing and talking about with the working group? I know Kevin McCabe is in the chat room right now. Uh, I mean, would you encourage him to take this distributional chart that you just put up there and and take it in there and say, hey, this is one of the things we need to talk about? Yeah, I would I would encourage him today when ICER presents the, the 2016 report to focus on the distributional aspects, to focus on the economic impacts of that. And I would encourage him to say at the end of that, Mr. Chairman, we need to have uh, or Mr. Coordinator, Facilitator, whatever the title is, we need to have we need to have additional distributional analyses. We need ledge finance to come in and do additional distrib distributional analyses of the various options that we're talking about. We need to see what the impact is on who pays, and we need to see the impact on the Alaska economy uh, from these from these uh, from these various approaches. Based on what you're seeing right now in the working group and the movement of the special session and everything else. Give us your prediction, Brad, put on your Kreskin turban and hold the crystal ball in front of you and tell us what do you think happens? Well, it's hard not to be pessimistic at this particular moment um, about what the working group's going to come up with. Um, it, 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 I would, I, I hope that there are behind the scenes backroom discussions going on that are actually moving toward uh, some sort of overall solution uh, those certainly uh, haven't haven't broken out uh, into the public. Uh, the special session uh, is going to be uh, if if it doesn't have a, a solid working group recommendation on what on where to go, the special session is going to break down into a battle over uh, over uh, PCE and over the PFD and and just trying to get through just trying to get through this year. So I hope the working group comes forward with a, with an overall approach. My fear, of course, is that they, again, I mean, this was supposed to be a twofold issue. It was supposed to come up with a solution for the PFD, putting it out of reach and taking it off the table, and then going on to our long-term fiscal problems. And it just seems like this stumbling block just keeps getting in our way. I mean, we've been fighting this fight uh, on the size and scope of government for years, but this PFD fight for just the last six or seven years, but it just seems like there's just no end in sight at this point. No, but Michael, Alaskans, I don't think Alaskans understand the issue fully. I don't, they haven't seen the distributional analyses. They haven't had people focus on how unfair using PFD cuts are to, uh, to Alaska families and how uh, injurious, how, how much damage it does to the overall Alaska economy. And that's, that's why I think, you know, Kevin and others need to stress that, need to focus on that in the days ahead. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Uh, we're going to continue with him here in just a second. Uh, first, Brad, give us a quick tease going into number two. That was number one, which is they have to look at the distributional uh, aspects of it and, and who it affects. Now we're going to move on to number two. You were just talking about it with Adam Wool. What happens? Uh, what, what's going on there? Give us a quick tease. Well, HB 37, Adam Wool's HB 37 is is a flattish has a flattish tax in it. He gave a presentation to the committee uh, last week or the, the working group the last week or the week uh, must maybe the week before uh, the, at the same time as Mike Shower's presentation uh, talking about the attributes of his uh, of his approach, but it left out one huge component. Uh, and when you look at that component, you understand you 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 have an entirely different view of HB 37 than you would uh, if you look at uh, at just uh, Adam's presentation. And we're going to walk through what that component is that he left out. We're moving on over to number two now, which is uh, the discussion of Adam Wool's plan. Uh, Brad, what's uh, what's what's on your mind here with this? What's on the agenda? So last week, Adam Wool made a pre or the week before, Adam Wool made a presentation to the working group about his HB 37. And HB 37 is started out 
uh, as mostly a flat tax, uh, a little uh, through the through the manipulation of the deductions, uh, 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 more progressive than than flat, but uh, but flattish, a flattish tax. But as it's gone through the process, uh, Adam has has changed it uh, to include deeper and deeper PFD cuts. In his presentation to the commit to the working group, all he presented was the um, was the the flat tax portion. That was the tax portion, uh, and he did. I'll I'll give him this credit, this one credit. He did a distributional analysis, but just of the tax portion, just of the flat tax portion, and it shows that when you do that distributional analysis. It shows up as a slightly as a as a progressive uh, as a progressive tax again because of the way they manipulate the deductions. Uh, it shows up as a progressive tax. So yesterday, when uh, everybody was getting ready for when people were encouraging others to get ready for the test of public testimony last night, the Anchorage Democrats were were you know praising Adams' uh, uh, tax approach HB 37. Praising that and saying that you know you know testify in favor of that that's a great approach you know it's slightly progressive it's the way to it's the way to go well the problem is Adam left out of his presentation out of the out of the distributional analysis in his presentation the effect of PFD cuts so what you see in his distributional presentation is just sort of the tip of the iceberg just the just the tax portion uh, of the of the combined approach. I, I, if, if you've got the chart up, I sent you a chart right. that shows the full analysis, including both the PF, the effect of the PFD cut and the tax approach. And and once you combine those two, you see it's hugely regressive. Uh, under that approach, uh, a single mother uh, with forty thousand dollars in income is paying three point two times uh, what uh, uh, what. Uh, uh, a top one percent uh, family is paying. A bottom, a, a bottom, a low twenty uh, uh, percent family is paying uh, roughly six, seven times uh, what the top one percent is paying. So, we, when you analyze, when you analyze HB thirty seven, while some say, "Oh, it's great because it's got you know this flattish tax that's, that tilts a little bit progressive," that's a great thing. It, they're, they're, that's the problem with not doing a full distribution analysis. They're, that doesn't do a full distributional analysis uh, of the bill. And Michael, here's what's going on. Here, here's what here's what Adam is doing. He's 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 trying to he's trying to hit a price point, right? He says basically what he's telling himself is I can sell a 2.5 percent uh, flat tax. That price point I can sell. So I'm going to put that out there and say that's what I'm doing. Uh, with uh, with my approach, and then not talking about the PFD cuts, he's trying to hide the PF the impact of the PFD cuts because he knows if he went to an actual flat tax based upon the deficit that we have, it'd be like a six or a seven or an eight uh, percent uh, flat tax as opposed to a two point five percent flat tax. The realization that our deficit is that big that every Alaska family would have to pay, you know, eight percent of their income uh, in a state income tax to close that deficit, would result in people pushing back on spending, right? Uh, and would result in, uh, you know, in in a substantial uh, pushback on on the cost of government. They don't want to do that. Adam and others don't want to do that. So all they're showing. Is the is the is the income tax effect the flat tax effect of that? Thinking well, everybody will say, "Oh, we're going to solve the problem with a 2.5 percent flat tax." Yeah, I can go with that. Not realizing, without without the disclosure of the huge impact that's being that's being attached to that in terms of in terms of PFD cuts. So it's 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 a manipulation. The presentation on HB 37. Uh, and and the discussion about HB 37 is a manipulation of the facts, showing only the tip of the iceberg, showing only the tax effect, and not showing the the, the distributional impact nor the economic impact of the of the PFD cuts that that are that are that are joined with it. 
Well, and we've talked about this before, and we were just talking about it, in fact, during the break. We were saying, look, this this appears to be intentional that they just don't want to, again, sticking their fingers in the ear and going la, 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 la. That's the, uh, that seems to be the, the uh, you know, kind of the impression here. Uh, at what point do you realize that this is not just some kind of, oh, we've overlooked it, it's not just a misstep, it is, at this point, intentional, that they are intentionally being willfully blind on this so they don't have to address it and they can still focus on taking the PFD. Yeah, it is uh, it is intentional. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's absolutely no question in my mind that it's intentional. If you look at, at, uh, at, at Adam's presentation, there's a discussion in the front end about what the PFD cuts are, the level of the PFD cuts uh, from current law. But then when you get to the back end and you look at the impacts of it, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what you're doing distributionally to the various income brackets, there's nothing, no mention uh, of that, uh, no analysis of that whatsoever. So it's not like they don't know that they're making PFD cuts. I mean, they admit that deep PFD cuts. They admit that up front. It's it's that they don't want to show it uh, when they when they get to the back end because they they don't want people to understand how much. Uh, they're taking a middle out of middle and lower income Alaska families, and as I say, I think in Adam's case, it's a price point thing. He know, he thinks he can sell 2.5, um, and and without getting pushback on the cost of government, everybody will say, "Yeah, I'll pay 2.5," and uh, you know, go on with that. Uh, but that's not real. Uh, but that's not the real cost of government. The real cost of government is the combination of of his tax plus uh, the PFD cut, uh, and that's much. That's much, much higher than 2.5. And I think, frankly, he's just trying to hide that. Uh, and when you look at this chart, I mean, the real startling thing is to see, the, especially the top 20%, uh, where it goes from, uh, you know, from the like seven times all the way up to the highest brackets. When you're talking about the top four or the top 1%, you're talking about 13 to 26 times the economic impact. Uh, on a lower uh, income family versus what's going on in the top. I mean, that's just it's it's abhorrent at that point. It is, and that's and that's the kind of analysis that that the committee needs to that the group needs to have in front of it, and Alaskans need to see the Alaska press uh, needs to see uh, in in chart form. Once you see that, you understand what's going on. You understand the top 20% are trying to trivialize their contribution by pushing it to middle and lower income Alaska families. You understand the size of the deficit and the impact it's going to have on lower and middle income uh, Alaska families. So I think it's critical yeah. that we that we have this sort of full disclosure. Absolutely. Uh, and this chart is available on your uh, Facebook page, right? It is. Okay. So you can find that at the top of the video or just go to Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, on Facebook, and you could find that ak4sb.com is the website. Uh, all right, Brad. Let's so uh, we get time for number three here. We got about three minutes. So the 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 oil search saga continued uh, this week. We've talked about oil search and the and and oil search, which is an Australian company that operates the Pika project uh, in Alaska. The Pika project is a is a big part of what people are hoping to see in the latter part of this decade in terms of increased volumes. I've been concerned about that project, uh, uh, oil search's ability to uh, finance it, uh, oil search's ability to uh, to develop it. Uh, the saga took yet another twist uh, this week. Uh, Santos, which is another Australian company, uh, made a bid for oil search to buy oil search, merge with oil search, um, and oil search accepted it and is recommending it to shareholders. Uh, that's going to really change the dynamic around around the owner of the Pika project. Santos is focused on Australian um, and and nearby uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, they have a, a piece of the of the LNG projects there. They're really focused on Australia and Southeast Asia uh, projects. They really don't have any projects outside of Southeast Asia. The one good thing of Santos is they have a deeper financial base. And so they'd be better positioned to finance uh, Pika, but I think it's a real question around whether uh, uh, Santos is going to have any interest in, in Pika. The one uh, one piece, one comment on this uh, from the Financial Times uh, uh, and uh, response to the merger analysis: analysts said oil search's rapid U-turn 
on the merger proposal reflected the company's weakened position following recent management turmoil and concerns about its expansion in Alaska. Oil Search's board has raised the white flag, having been weakened in the wake of management churn and governance concerns and pressured to a merger by increasingly frustrated investors. The acceptance of the offer can essentially be viewed as a capitulation by Oil Search that their Alaska asset is not worth what they hoped it would be. Um, and I think I think that raises, I mean, Santos is going to have the same view. And I think that really raises concerns about where the PICA project is going. And that backs into fiscal policy because a lot of the of Governor Dunleavy's revenue projections at the, at the latter end of the decade are based on PICA volumes uh, coming up. If those volumes don't show up, if that investment isn't made or that investment is, is significantly uh, delayed, uh, as I think will probably be the result of this merger, uh, then those volumes don't show up, the revenues don't show up, and the and the fiscal hole that we're in is deeper than $1.5 billion. So, uh, big project, important <clears throat> to follow. Well, this is what always kills me about revenue projections from the state of Alaska. The, the You know, it just seems like they are continuously pie in the sky. It's very rosy outcome. It's never planned for the worst and hope for the best. It's always planned for the best and hope for the best. Uh, it seems like historically to me, after watching this for the last 20 years, that that seems to be the modus operandi for the state government. They don't look at worst case scenarios, uh, which I mean, you would think that as a as a government planners, they should look at worst case scenarios and plan for that. And then everything else beyond that would just be gravy at that point, Brad. Yeah, they don't they don't want to confront reality. I mean, every governor, uh, Parnell, Walker. Uh, Dunleavy has has had these has had these you know huge projections. Walker was more realistic, frankly. I'll give him that. Uh, but they've had these huge projections of oil price increases uh, and uh, and production increases. And on the oil price side, we've talked about this before. On the oil price side, they're projecting you know much higher oil prices, ever ever increasing oil prices through the remainder of the decade. You look at the futures market where people are really putting their money based upon their expectations of where oil prices go, um, and and they and the futures market has oil prices going down uh, through the remainder of the decade in response to to, to various uh, uh, various uh, potential uh, uh, developments. Uh, and now you look at 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 you know the volumes that the that the administration is predicated on. Uh, they've got Willow in for for a, a big chunk, and they've got Pika in toward the end of the the the, the decade. They've got uh, they've got Pika in, and you know, Pika is a troubled project. It is, I mean, it's a big project, lots of oil, uh, a great uh, potential find uh, for Alaska, huge opportunity for uh, Alaska, but in a world that is swimming in oil and oil opportunities. Uh, and oil development opportunities, it's just not that big a deal. And and I think oil search betting as much of their company on PICA as they did, I mean, we've seen what this what the investor market thinks of that. Uh, oil search is the investors were abandoning oil search and now oil search has found a has found a merger partner. Um, so I <laughs> We're, 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 we are, and that's 1.5 billion. I mean, that's assuming the oil prices go up and assuming production goes up is underpins the 1.5 billion. You take those out uh, and that number, the, the deficit number becomes even higher. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we are not in good shape and we need to understand how not good shape we're in so that, so that we make wise choices about where we're headed. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Final thoughts here, 30 seconds, in case you got anything else left over. No, uh, follow. Uh, I would say that, you know, for people that are focused on the oil side, follow what's going on with PICA. This is going to be a very rough patch. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I think ultimately what happens is PICA gets sold to somebody else. And and the sooner that happens, the sooner it can stay on course uh uh, for for development, it's it's going to be it's going to go into limbo here while the Santos merger is going on. Well, I appreciate it, Brad. Thank you for coming in and uh, being part of it. As always, a good discussion, and we look forward to seeing what this uh, what plays out next week. Thanks for coming in, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. 
This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.